got me going. Beautiful. Um, uh, as you've probably just noticed, I've just uh, switched that on. Our services, most of our services are going to be online, live streamed. <clears throat> so if you have any uh, reservations or anything like that, yeah, I, um, I'm going to get Jeff up. Yeah, just to, um, they'll be online and we'll post them on our Facebook page and on our website as well. But I'm going to invite Jeff to come up and uh, to read God's word to us this morning before I preach. Thanks, Jeff. Right. Um, three subheadings. The birth of Jesus foretold. Mary visits Elizabeth and Mary's song. This is how it goes. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will it be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to the town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices 
be God my Saviour. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed the mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has fed the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our father. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. The Word of God. Thanks, Jeff. A great passage, really great passage. Um, the recording as well, sorry. What's happening? There we go. Um, Songs of Christmas is uh, the title of uh, the series uh, that I started last week. And so we're going to look at another song on Christmas Day. Um, what Child Is This? I hope I got that right, Margaret. So a uh, great passage. I'm going to be drawing from that as well. Um, today's title is Mary's Song, The First Carol. Um, which really depicts, I think, a lot about um, what God did there. I mean, uh, 2020, what a year, eh? I think we'll, we'll never forget that, will we? 2020, what a year. You know, I guess popular opinion would agree that 2020 was the, the worst year on record for a very, very long time. And uh, we might be glad to see the back end of it, would we? Just a few more sleeps and... Uh, and 2020 is gone, and hopefully 2021 will be uh, much uh, better. And um, we hope that, because 2020, you know, showed us a lot of grim things: terrorism, you know, climate change in the news, police brutality, of course, the Black Lives Matter protests, um, the Philippines, tall volcano, volcano, sorry. Killed 6,000 people on a local level, I guess. Uh, oh, there's my welcome, sorry. Bushfires, right at the start of the year. Well, even before the start of the year. Um, 34 lives lost, 400 died of smoke inhalation. <clears throat> we don't think of that. And to top it off, of course, global pandemic. Good news, Ross. <laughs> Preach the good news. No, it's good to look at reality and see what happened. One million lives lost and continuing to rise, of course, globally. 10,000 a day, they are estimating. You know, that, that's, that's something we're going to we're going to look back upon. Not forgetting the economic and the social impact of the coronavirus, mental illness, a lot of other issues that are connected to it. On a more personal note, this is a photo from down Lake Conjola that Jenny and I were part of the fires uh, last year and, and New, Year's, uh, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. And three days after that, we were down there with our power locked in. We couldn't go anywhere because of all the trees and the power lines that were down. It's just a little sort of skinny 
road 7Ks down to the lake. We were evacuated three days later. We found out 89 homes were lost just in that little area and three deaths in the community, um, just the nearby suburbs. So, pretty devastating. Then, in February, we got the floods. <laughs> and that's down at Kajola as well, the old boat shed. We got flooded out, the caravan down the bottom, but um, insurance come good, so I was really pleased about that. I thought we weren't going to get a cent off it. And then August, didn't we? We had to isolate. And we went into lockdown. Church was closed, community contact ceased pretty much, and work from home began, and that's probably been going about eight months. Strange year. A year of unplanned, what should I, surprises. And that's just what Mary and her experience it could be described as. Unplanned surprise. The young virgin there, told by an angel, who usually scares everybody, that she's going to have and be with a child. But how? Just unplanned. And it's with that sort of backdrop I want to bring us into the story today because we're going to learn a lot. And it's going to help us how to how to really move forward in the next year. Unplanned, unforeseen things, and yet still seeking God's will and purposes for our lives and for our church, as I've written in the bulletin. Please, please read that when you get a chance. But on the other hand, this year brought some real joy for people. You probably recognise her, maybe, Kylie Moore Gilbert. Now, she was a, a Politician, one of our politicians that was released from an Iranian prison after I think two years of being held captive. Terrible, terrible circumstances. Another extremely joyful person is Fahad Bandesh, of course, um, not Craig Johnson, was the soccer guy. Anyway, he, he advocated for him and he got released after a number of years in uh, detention on Manus Island over there at PNG, three days before his trial and they released him. That joy that these two guys, you know, they're just a small example, have experienced has really transformed their lives, past, present and future. How so, Ross? Because all those hardships are now viewed through a lens of joy, of a great outcome and a better future. And that's how we're going to view our future. We're going to see it through the lens of Mary this morning. On a different note, and a funny sort of note, I guess, to me it's funny, some of the uh, writers here, uh, the old coin, the coin the phrase, uh, music soothes the savage, savage beast. You ever heard that? Music soothes the savage beast. Well, that's not the effect the first carol had on many who take it seriously. E. Stanley Jones, the famous Methodist preacher and scholar, called the Christmas carol I'm speaking of as the most revolutionary document in the history of the world. Wow, that's, that's really saying something. William Temple, the Archbishop of Canterbury, instructed missionaries in poverty-stricken India never to read the words of this Christmas song in public because it could incite riots in the streets. Why? Baptist writer, well-known Baptist writer, Walter Sherman, said that when you read the lyrics of this carol, you sniff the powder of dynamite. So explosive is Mary's song. I'm talking about, of course, the Magnificat, the song that Jeff read out there in verses 46 to 55. It's called that, of course, through the Latin language, um, magnify, that first word means magnify. It's the work of a girl, a peasant girl that we know as Mary. Now, I don't know about you, but most unwed young girls, teenage girls, don't burst into song when they find out they're pregnant. 
And Mary would have been wondering, what is going on? What's this all about? How am I going to... What will people say? Put yourself in her shoes just for a moment. But there was something about Mary that made all the difference. Mary had learned to trust God. Hear me now. Between the lines, if we hear what Jeff read to us this morning, we pick up a profile of Mary which tells us much about her. She's been raised in a poor but godly home. But she'd learned that God had been good and he was faithful. She heard she was going to be the mother of the Messiah, but she wasn't to know how that was going to turn out for her, either in the present or the future. She simply heard the angel say in verse 7, 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. And she answered him with total surrender. Listen to this. I am the Lord's servant. What a response. If only we could do the same. She'd learned that God was faithful and she trusted him. Verse 38 tells it all, may it be done to me according to your word. What trust, what faith in God's word. What reliance in God's word to turn everything out just the way God has intended it to be. I love Christmas time. I really do. As a preacher, I love digging into these passages because they teach us so much about life and about the Lord and how God works. Mary's personal choices also prepared her for the surprise. Verse 27 34 described Mary as a virgin. She decided early on in life to maintain moral purity. Now hear me, young people. Well, it's not just for young people. Take hold of that. Because that puts you in a place where God can use you, where God's favour is upon you. It's not an insignificant thing, it's so important. But for all of, all of us, moral purity, the way we think, the way we, our motives, the way we live, so important to God. And it puts us in that position where God can bless us and have favour upon us. So when the news came to her, you know, she knew God was going to do something amazing, something special. She also knew the true identity of the son she would bear. So let's hear what the angel said to her first in verse 30 to 33. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favour with God. You'll conceive and give birth to a son and you'll call him Jesus. He'll be great and you'll be called the son of the most high. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. Mary would have heard those titles. Did you hear them? Jesus, God's salvation. Son of the most high, Messiah. For a Jewish girl, she would have knew them. They would have been like bells ringing in her ears. Boom, boom. Before anyone else on earth knew who he was or why he came, Mary knew something of who he was. Many call her the first evangelist. And she told the gospel in song. Well, we're almost ready to hear her solo. But as soon as that angel departed, you know what she did? She made a beeline to, to, to Elizabeth's place in Judea, a two and a half day road trip. I don't understand it. <laughs> Shouldn't she have just burst into song? No. She heads off there. And as soon as Mary enters the house and Elizabeth hears a voice, the Holy Spirit confirms it. And what happens? The baby leaps in Elizabeth's womb. Elizabeth, who's too old to have a baby, has conceived. Of course, she's going to have John the Baptist, isn't she? Jesus' cousin? I don't know. They get mixed up in that genealogy. Something like that. Listen to the words. Verse 42, 43. You are the most blessed of women, Elizabeth says. 
and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me? She says, that the mother of my Lord should come to me. She's speaking through the Holy Spirit. It says she was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost came inside of it as soon as she heard Mary's voice. Isn't that remarkable? God was doing something amazing, something unheard of, something unplanned. First the angel's words, and then Elizabeth's confirmation. It was all that Mary needed. She couldn't contain it anymore. She's going to be part of changing the course of human history. Wow. I don't know if you've ever heard the word of God or the prophetic word come. Boom. It's like an explosion in you. It lightens up things. Dots join them. God's purposes, his word, it all comes together like that. Kabam. This is what's happening to Mary. She's simply overwhelmed with joy and God's grace because it's not only going to change the course of history, it's going to change her life as well, powerfully and indefinitely. And I was thinking about this, and some of you, you know, you might have heard, of course, sorry, I just... I forgot all that. You were supposed to be reading that. Oh, a bit rusty. You know, with the passing of Maradona, who heard that just a couple of weeks ago, the three-day morning for the great, arguably the greatest soccer player in the world. I think he pips Pelé and he pips uh, Messi just because of his sheer skill. It reminded me the 86 World Cup, and I was a soccer player. I loved it. Maradona, you remember that? That's after he scored. He's just weaved his way through half the team and then popped it in the net. It looked like the ball was connected to his foot. The defenders said later that he's passing, that he was like no one else. When he got the ball, he was gone. He didn't have a chance. And I remember the great... Commentator. Of course, he was Spanish or he was speaking Spanish. Argentinian, of course. Victor Hugo Morales. He was so overwhelmed by the events. England were knocked out. They were the favourites. And of course, Argentina went through to win the World Cup for the first time. Elation. A country in uproar at their greatest hero. This is what he said. He was so overwhelmed he forgot he was commentating. And he yells this out. Go! Go! Oh, he did! Go! He was overwhelmed so much. Maradona. Maradona, he said. Diego, Diego. Diego Maradona, the greatest the footballer in history. Diego, what planet did you come from, Diego? <laughs> Diego Armando Maradona. And he bursts into tears at the end. Argentina, do. England, nil. And he sobs off. And then he goes back out of it and starts commentating again. He was so overwhelmed with this event that he lost it. He was in tears, he was raving on for five minutes, I cut it short. He called Maradona everything. <laughs> Beautiful under the sun, let me tell you. And that's exactly what Mary did. As soon as she received that word, she burst into song. She was so overwhelmed for praise, not for her national hero, Maradona, but for her Lord and God. Because the Saviour was going to be born. God's word was going to be fulfilled. There will be a Messiah. And she knew it. Do you get it? Do you get that, John? Do you grasp what's going on there? I'm not talking about a little Christmas tale today. I'm talking about a world-shattering, changing event. Something that God has ordained for that just right time as Romans 5 tells us. So let's hear the heart of this young girl. She calls him God my Saviour in the opening line of her song. 
Verse 47. My soul, she says, glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. Do you hear those words? It dispels the Catholic uh, misconception, that fallacy that she is somehow born without a sin nature, that she is an offspring of an immaculate conception. No, rubbish. She sees herself as a sinner in need of a saviour. That's what that verse tells us clearly. She's a sinner in need of a saviour like the rest of us, every one of us. And she declares that in her opening verse. Wonderful. Then she sings about you know, God looking on the humble condition of his servant in 48. Literally, literally she just says, wow, I'm so small. That Mary was struck, of course, how different God's choice is from how men tend to choose. And she felt that question, why me, Lord? Why? Why choose me? Just that little servant girl, a peasant girl from the backwater. Why? And then it leads me to my last observation. She sees God's action to order as evidence of his mercy. Uh, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. That's her way of saying, God, you know, you didn't give me what I deserve. You chose me anyway. And it's one gift you won't find under the tree this Christmas. You know what gift that is? The gift of God's grace, like you just said, the gift of Jesus Christ who has come to you and I. He has come in the story and he awaits our response. That we might recognise him like Mary did and come to him. But hang on, the second verse is coming. Look at this. She turns to the world system and interprets it through the meaning of Christ's coming. Out of deep joy, she's reminded of God's acts, past acts. And how he's done great things for Israel in the past. Now, I don't know about you, but wouldn't you think that would be parting the Red Sea? I think so. What about David and Goliath? Awesome. Elijah and the 400 prophets or 4,000, how many? Yeah. Amazing things. The Passover. <laughs> Come on. Wouldn't you think of those things, wouldn't you? But that's not what she recalls at all. She sees God's mighty acts in the past as mercy given to all. Let's read it together. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers and their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he sent the rich away empty. Do you hear what she recalls as the mighty acts of God? They're not what we think. She chooses to recall the kindness and mercy that God's shown to all his people. He removes the proud, you know, that is those who oppose God. I just want you to look around the room. I really do. Because these are the mighty acts of God. Look around. We have all been shown mercy. And we're just a drop in the bucket for the thousands and millions of people that God has shown his mighty acts of kindness and grace. I don't look for the big thing. I look for the small. Look for the everyday accounts of God's great and mighty acts and you, you, will, you will swell with joy once again in God's grace and mercy. Lastly, he said he'll exalt the, hum the humble. Isn't that great? The mighty have been toppled. And he exalts the lowly, he lifts them up, Peter said, doesn't he? James. And the meek end up inheriting the earth. And this song calls us to reverse our ambitions. Hear me, brothers and sisters. 
We must reverse our ambitions if we want to be successful in God's eyes, in God's world, in God's economy. It's not the way of the world, <laughs> lifting ourselves up, patting ourselves on the back, thinking how great we are, what we've achieved, how rich and powerful we are. No, that's not God's economy at all. Humble <laughs> and needy. They're the qualities God's looking for. Oh, where do I go for now? Where do I go? Verse 53. No? I'll oh, down the bottom. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent away the rich end. God is looking for people that are hungry for him. Let me tell you now. Oh, this isn't a Christmas message, Ross, is it? It's exactly why he chose Mary. She was hungry for God to do his will. May your work be done according to him. What did Jesus say? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness because they will be filled. That's my cry this Christmas. I'll be filled. I'll be filled by God. Is that your cry today? Because that's Mary's cry. The church of Jesus Christ is for people who feel their own emptiness and need to be filled. That's a qualification. Oh, great, Ross, I thought I'd get a Bible college now. No. Conclusion, he shows mercy to those who don't deserve it. He chooses the lowly over the proud and he finds the hungry and fills them. God's on the side who don't, who don't put their trust in themselves and this describes Mary and her story. Mary's joy is assured by God's faithful acts in the past and he's promised to be merciful in the future. To Abraham's descendants forever. Verse 54 and 55, and I haven't got that there, sorry. Listen to this. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised his ancestors. That's a promise for you and me. Him, brother and sister, it is. That's our promise. We have here in Mary's song something that we can rejoice in. Don't worry about 2020, what's happened. We've got something to rejoice in, in God our Saviour, in that merciful act continuing because we are the descendants of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ. I'm happy. <laughs> I am. The patterns of God, hear me now. Listen to me. I want to teach you something this morning. The patterns of God and his ways of working in the past give us a sense of how he acts in the present and how he will act in the future. Get hold of that. Listen to that and lock yourself in because that is where our faith and our assurance, we're talking about it in Hebrews when I come back from holidays, that is what it's all about for the writer in Hebrews. He knows God's going to be faithful. He knows God's going to act this way because he's done it before and he's doing it now and he's doing it again. He doesn't change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. But we've got a God that doesn't change. He's not unpredictable. He's not unplanned. Everything else is. Don't worry. He's not. He's not. He's our faithful high priest. He's our faithful God. Those plans, of course, are outworked and fulfilled in the birth of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And just like Mary, whose joy was deeply rooted in that past faithfulness, cemented in God's promises of his continued grace to us, and that's why we can have a joy that remains. A joy that's inexpressible, Peter says. A joy that fills us. The fullness of joy. Christmas is all about joy. Not about joy about the presence, like Jesus is saying under the tree. No, joy about God, our Saviour, and His salvation, His continuing promises to you and me. Now, listen to me. That experience of meeting Jesus, of realising that joy, 
transforms our lives past, present and future. How so, Ross? Because when we know those things, joy fills us. And everything that is broken in the past, all our past failures and all those things, listen to me, that joy trickles into it. Like into a, a crack. It trickles in and it changes what their meaning is. And it transforms us. Do you understand that? It really does. All those past failures, all those things that define us, our, our, our weaknesses, our sin, all the stuff that's happened to us that tends to define who we are is changed by God's great grace and his faithfulness, past, present and future, and it trickles in, it flows into us. And our lives, my past, I'm not going to tell you all about it, you know, that is all transformed into God's purposes and his plan for me. <laughs> and it moves into the future that I can have joy in the future. I'm not depressed about being 60 next year. Most people have a melting. I'm rejoicing. No, you wouldn't, Mark. Of course not. You've got the joy of the Lord. You know his purposes are good. So what defines you this morning in closing? Sorry, just a little longer. First sermon back, and give you a dose. <laughs> what defines you? Just past failures or something that's happened to you? Because what I've found is that when we, we end up defining our lives by past failures, regrets and those events that have hurt us and scarred us in some way, we don't get that joy. But the good news, here we go, here's the punchline, the good news of Christ and Christianity is that God transforms all of that and he sent his son to prove it. And I'm going to say it on Christmas Day. How do we know God loves us? Oh, he sent his son. How beautiful. And that deep joy that we experience comes from understanding God's purposes for our lives, even in the midst of seemingly strange circumstances and unplanned lives like we've experienced this year. And just like Mary's was, I thought it was a great story to relate to where we're at. Do you think she planned for all that? <laughs> Not a chance. No way. But she moved forward with God because she understood these things. Whatever has defined you, let the joy of Christ and his birth transform all of that this Christmas. And may the joy of Christmas and Christ be yours this year. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you're so faithful that you're Grace and mercy extends to us today and forever. Just as you extended your mercy in the past. And we want to give you praise and we ask you to fill us today. Fill us, God, that our joy might be full and we might rejoice in our Saviour. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good to hear that. Yeah, if you're, if you're uh, our last song uh, today for Carol Joy to the World. What else? Huh? You can read it like a book. <laughs> Thank you.